Hello. Um, let's just get this out of the way right up front. Yeah, they're fake. <laughs> uh, and yes, my real ones did try to kill me. So take a good look. There they are. Give me the side view <laughs> for the moment. Actually, quite proud of them now. But um, now I'm going to ask you to change your focus a little bit. Move your eyes up. Take a look at my eyes, please, because I have a story to tell. <clears throat> On September 18th, 2009, I was diagnosed with DCIS, which is ductal carcinoma in C2, at the ripe old age of 37. Um, I had started out going to my annual mammogram on a Monday that came back with some abnormalities. And so on Tuesday, I was asked to go back to take a closer look. Based on a strong family history of breast cancer, they whisked me off to St. Mary's to the LAC Center um, for um, follow-up biopsies and appointments. So let me recap my week for you. Monday, mammogram. Tuesday, abnormalities. Wednesday, I don't remember Wednesday. Thursday, an appointment at St. Mary's. Thursday afternoon, biopsy. Friday morning, the call came in when I was home alone. You have cancer. This is one week. The C word, the game changer. What do you do? Well, I cried. I called in a support team, a massive support effort. Uh, I threw up, I'll admit that. Um, and I found that I couldn't talk about it. I couldn't tell anyone what was going on, but I could write. So I started a blog because I wanted to make things very simple and clear for my friends. I had a bad tata. I'm an athlete, I'm a non-smoker, I eat well, I exercise, I don't drink much in excess that often. <laughs> um, I breastfed for the fully recommended one year. Um, I even tested negative for the BRCA1 and 2 gene, which means I was not genetically predisposed to get cancer. Why? I quickly gave up on that quest um, to battle my inner demon, which was the not knowing what this meant. So, I started out with a stage zero cancer, which I was told, if you're gonna get breast cancer, this is the one to get. Where's Rich? Woo! -hoo! <laughs> but I had it in multiple places, so they wanted to do an MRI to find out if it was anywhere else. So you get the MRI and then you wait. The MRI came back, there's a suspicious area. So you get another biopsy and you wait. And then I think there was another MRI in there and you wait and you wait and you wait. And it was, it, it was absolutely impossible. And at the same time, I had something else weighing very heavily on my mind. I'd like to introduce you to my mother. This is Mary Jane Cars. She too was diagnosed in her early 30s with breast cancer. She went through chemotherapy in the 80s, uh, mastectomy, and one month shy of her five year anniversary, she was diagnosed again, this time with cancer in her liver. It quickly moved into her brain, and she died on September 9th, 1984. She was 36 years old, and I was 12. Was history repeating? Had I just run out of time? I couldn't help but think about my own mortality um, and all the things that I've done in my life, and more importantly, the things that I've not done. The time that I've spent with my son or not, the time that I spent cleaning the house, alphabetizing my CDs, because that was important, um, instead of teaching him valuable life lessons or spending time with my grandmother. And finally, what it came down to me, uh, for me, was a decision. My options were as follows. Lumpectomy plus six weeks of radiation plus five years of tamoxifen, which is a hormone therapy. Or the bilateral mastectomy. The magic words came to me from my good friend, Dr. Gil Padula, who said, Jen, both of these will cure you physically. You need to pick the one that's gonna cure you psychologically. And so obviously, I chose the bilateral, and yes, I upgraded. <laughs> Wouldn't you? My friends loved it, <laughs> truly. So I'm here today, cancer-free, and on November 2nd, I will officially be a two-year breast cancer survivor. So let's talk today about game changers, curveballs. The headline of USA Today on September 1st read, 9-11, a life-altering day of loss and change. A soldier becomes a pastor. A widow writes a book that influences thousands of people 
An atheist finds faith and religion. Some call them turning points. I was paralyzed. I got a divorce. Um, I crashed my car, or I almost crashed my car. My question for you here today is, does it need to be a crisis first? Why wait? Decide today. What did you hear here today? How high does unemployment need to get? How many children need to go to bed hungry? How many days do you have to go through the motions of doing something that you're really not meant to do before you make a change? It shouldn't take a cancer diagnosis to make you change your life and to live life right. But sometimes it does. And now I'm going to overshare about my health even just a little bit more. In June of last year, I went in for a routine procedure. I was getting a cyst removed from my uterus. Um, and uh, everything went well, and I got the call. Once again, I was home alone, standing in my kitchen. I remember exactly where I was. And the doctor said, Jen, everything went fine. It's gone. It came back from the lab. And then she said the word that made my legs fold. She said, but. But we found precancerous cells inside of the cyst. Now, it's gone. I had a procedure to ensure that I can't get them again, and everything is fine. But stop a moment and think about the word, but. What if I had just received another cancer diagnosis? What would I have done? Cried again, thrown up, called in the support team. Um, my current plans for the evening were to pick up my son and go out on my paddleboard out on the lake and watch the sunset with him. And then I realized it, the point that hit home. My plans, regardless of if I had been diagnosed with cancer again or not, were not going to change. That is how I knew that I was living my life right. So let me ask you, are you living your life right? Are you trying new things? Are you supporting the causes that matter the most to you? Are you spending time with the people that you care about? Are you traveling the world? And I'll admit it, this is Paris, Las Vegas. <laughs> He's young. <laughs> Are you finding balance with yourself and with others? So what? Why are you here today? What did you learn? Not just from me, from everyone else that you heard. What was the big idea? I was recently at a conference in Atlanta and talking with a friend of mine who's the CEO of a technology company, found out we both like TED, TED stuff. And he said, I should have known it. You have that post TEDx glow. <laughs> I thought, wow, the post TEDx glow. How do we, how do we keep that going? How, do we, how can we put that into practice so that we all walk out of here glowing? What was your game changer today? And so now I have an assignment for you. And for the people who are at home live streaming, I understand there are quite a few more actually out there, is to get out a piece of paper and write down the one thing that you are going to do today because of this. And I'll give you a couple of seconds off my time clock there. So some examples include, um, have you been thinking about starting a new business? You've run out of excuses today. Have you thought about a way that we can change the way that we teach our children based on what we saw? It happens now. If you've come up with a way to revolutionize the way we spend time at work so we can spend more time with our kids, please write it down. And then I'm going to push it just a little bit more, and I'm going to ask you to write your email address on the piece of paper and introduce yourself to your accountability partner, which is someone who is seated near you. It's this person's job to check in with you, to understand your idea, Understand what it is you said you were going to do and check in with you three months down the road, six months down the road, and make it happen. Don't just let this be a so what kind of a day. And I leave you with this, a direct order. And these are not my words, although I wish they were. The poet Anis Mojgani wrote this. And this is how I hope that you all leave TEDx Muskegon today full of fire and willpower and energy, ready to live life to the fullest, doing what you were meant to do as if your life depended on it. I took a little liberties with some of the words here. So you've been given a direct order to rock the bleep out. <laughs> rock out like you just won both showcase showdowns. Rock out like you get paid to disturb the peace. 
rock out like the plane is going down. There are 120 passengers and 121 parachutes. Rock out like the streets and the books are all on fire, and the only way to extinguish them is by doing the electric slide. Rock out like it's Saturday afternoon and Monday is a national holiday. Rock out like you are the international skee-ball champion of the universe. Rock out like you just escaped from an evil orphanage to join a Russian circus. <laughs> like your dead grandfather just came back to take a drive with you in your new car. Like you just got a book published. Like you went to your high school reunion to find everyone, even the women are all overweight and bald, except for the former homecoming queen who just got divorced from her impotent husband and only has eyes for you. <laughs> rock out like Jimmy has returned carrying brand new guitar strings. Rock out like this was the last weekend, like these were the last words, like you don't ever want to forget how. And these are my own words. Rock out like today is the day before you learn you have cancer. And rock out like today is the last day to be the best day of your life. Thank you.